90% of consumers read online reviews before visiting a business. What do people see when they look you up online? We give you the tools you need to take control of your reputation. Send surveys to your customers via text message with Testimonial Collector. Get five-star reviews on all the major platforms like Google, Yelp, and more. Track what people are saying about your business with Reputation Manager. Respond to comments and turn negative reviews into happy customers. See what your competitors' customers are saying about them with Competition Tracker. Learn great marketing tactics and what it takes to stay on top. A bigger social presence means more connections. Automatically generate and schedule engaging social media posts with Social 365. Build trust, boost sales, and grow your business. entertain you but to educate you so I want to thank you all for tuning in and for those who have been such amazing and faithful followers on the podcast even though I can't see you I see you I appreciate you with all the downloads oh I'm just I'm, I'm just so happy that means you really enjoy the guests that I have on the show that I bring to you to interview um, and for those um, agents and PR agents who just send me the best guests um, let's get the housekeeping out of the way. Um, so to make sure you guys check out Spin Wax Radio, download SpinWaxRadio.com, and we are also streaming there now also on Spin Wax Radio. So if you are um, an artist and music and they're into many different genres, check them out. They are always looking for new artists of all types. Make sure that you guys like and subscribe. Check out the website, Entrepreneur Life Show. Dot com. You will see all of the guest lineups coming up for our future guests, as well as all the past interviews and every place that we are streaming where you find your favorite podcast and or watch live streaming. Okay, so who do we have on this show today? So um, I have um, John Amato, who is, um, I, I can't wait to guys show you guys this, his, his video. Um, and just what his music. So as you guys know, I've had many different artists on the show. And I, I, I always say mine are the best um, because they're so influential. Um, he's taken his passion for drums. And let me tell you, it's and turned it into a musical art. So I say a musical art because way do you actually listen. And I mean, you have, it's like you have to, you have to have a skill. It's not just, how do I say this? How can you just, you play music and you just, you get that feeling from it without any words whatsoever and you just fall in love with it. Well, this is John Armato. Um, we're going to learn all about him, what he does, and when you hear his music, you're going to be like, yeah, I'm going to follow. I'm about to get that. So let's bring John onto the platform and introduce him and get the show started. Hello. Hello, Rose. How are you? <laughs> I am doing wonderful and better now that you're on the show and um, oh thank you because you know when I saw your bio and I, I went to your YouTube I saw some interviews as well as listened um extremely impressed um because you. you know I I like for me um I'm not obviously a musician but the um music is an art it's how you use it and and um and that's how I connect with music well, yeah, music is um, is all about connections. Uh, I mean, it's it's something you can do by yourself, but it, when you're providing it for other people to enjoy, it becomes something really special. And um, it, it's been a big, it's been the single largest part of my life. Um, it's the one thing that has always characterized who I am and what I do. 
So, I, I, so from what I read, you know, to get started with a, a few questions I have, is that, um, so I gathered, okay, from what I read, you're actually a native of Kansas, where you've kind of, you know, moved around from New York to California. I think you're still in California now, is that correct? I'm in Sacramento, California. I'm actually from Kansas City, Missouri. My family and friends will want to make sure that I say Missouri, not the Kansas Kansas City, Kansas City, Missouri, mm -hmm. uh, born and raised, and then spent four years in New York City, and I've been in Sacramento, California now for about 14 years. So, I know, is it, I, I'm like, what is in Kansas? So I say to you, even though I know Missouri, the show me state, what was your first introduction to, to music where you decided it was going to be the drums out of the many different instruments that you could have chosen as a youth that that was your that was what you said this is this is my passion right here yeah it's a great <laughs> question and i wish i had a better answer there are some things that we seem to just know or feel from the very beginning i've heard a variety of musicians describe the same experience where they can't pinpoint a moment mm -hmm. but it was just always present and uh, i lost both my parents in the past couple of years but they would tell you uh, that I was begging for drum lessons about as early as I could talk. It's just something I always wanted to do. And we have a little uh, little home movie clip of me getting my very first toy drum <laughs> at about five uh -huh. years old on Christmas Day. And um, how, how do you explain it? I don't know. We always had music playing in the house. My folks had great taste. There was uh, musicals and jazz and a easy listening and a little bit of popular music. Uh, but, you know, their era was the 50s, really. Right. Uh, I was born in 64 and grew up in the 70s. But I had that early influence, um, and I just always knew. Music just has a way of sort of crawling up your spine and bumping <laughs> a heart screen, and when it does, you resonate, and you have no choice. That's just the way it is. So I know when I was um, when listening, um, well, doing a little a bit of research on drums, I, I'm just talking about the instrument because, of course, when I said, okay, well, I'm going to have him on the show, I'm going to do my little bit of investigation and research. I'm impressed. So, from a little bit from what I've done, I know there are many different types of drums. And so, then snare, bass, um, you know, of course, you have your conga guns and the different types of kits that go with the drums. So, then my question is, okay, drums became your interest, but then how do you know what type of drum that makes the type of music that interests you to make the sound you want because there's so to, many I, different types. You're the only, this is the first time anyone's ever asked that. <laughs> I think that's a fascinating question. I really do. Um, I fell in love with drums. I fell in love with music. I fell in love with jazz. And all three of these things kind of were the same for me initially. Now, I think, especially when you're a little kid, the prey goes by and you hear the loud pulsations mm -hmm. of, you know, drums. There's something sort of primal and animalistic about that that's just exciting. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, if my folks were around, they would tell you a story of when I was still a kid. And I had started to get into drums and, and uh, was, I probably had started taking lessons at this point. And I was really into Buddy Rich. Mm -hmm. And who, you know, one of the world's most famous big band drummers always appeared on The Tonight Show and all this sort of thing. And I remember saying, you know, one of the things I wanted for Christmas was an album by Buddy Rich, but not one with just him. I wanted the full band. Now, where I got an idea that somebody would put out, um, you know, a, an album of, of Just Drum, which has been done since then, I don't know. But my emphasis was on the music. Right. It was the total experience of the music. So uh, by being exposed to jazz early on by falling in love with music holistically and not just the instrument itself, I was drawn towards jazz drums. So for me, that's a traditional kit, you know, like a four piece, what we call a four piece drum set, a snare, mm -hmm. a, a tom, a, and a low tom, and, and a couple of cymbals. And um, that's, that's jazz to me. And that's the way I like to make my music. And uh, that's what I fell in love with from the beginning and, and still in love with today. So now that I've got kind of the, the drum, because unless you have the right sticks, because there are so many sticks. And then I was like, so let me tell you, I did a little, I was doing my little bit of research. And so I was like, um, because when I watched your video and then I noticed that there were brushes, so I was like, I did, 
and I know something made this different kind of a sound, but then right. with the actual drumsticks, you have like the round ball, the acorn, and now of, of oh course, you know, gosh. that, the, um, it, the, the barrel, the, <laughs> the teardrop, and then, you know, that's just a few, and then of course the brushes, and then how they're made with like, the, I don't know if it's like wire or different hair, and I said, so how do you even know what's down? Because with the drum kit, you still have to make the sound that you want with the type of drum yeah. by the deck. <laughs> well, first of all, uh, your research is extraordinary. <laughs> no one's ever uh, dug in that deep out of you know casual curiosity uh, before. <laughs> uh, one of the things that is a joy and a frustration about drums mm -hmm. is the permutations of the sounds you can make is, for all intents and purposes, infinite. Now, this is a little unfair to my fellow musicians who play other instruments, but if you play a saxophone, you can get different models of saxes, mm -hmm. you can use different reeds, different mouthpieces, but then that's kind of it. Those are your variables. With drums, every drum is different. There's a multitude of heads that you can use on any given drum, a multitude of sticks and brushes and mallets and rods and whatever else, and then combine those into whatever setup you want, and it's just such an opportunity to select a sound palette that you like to work from. And I have loved brushes from the very beginning. Uh, and it's funny, my, my sister shared with me a story um, when she she shared some uh, of the uh, videos and, and write-ups that I've received about the album with some of her colleagues at work. And mm -hmm. uh, one of her colleagues said, I never knew they used brushes on drums. Right. And, and, and it, of course, why would you know? Why you right. know? It's just a sound that you hear. Right. But uh, I always love that swish that comes when you move the brushes across the head, and it, it allows you to create a sustained sound, whereas a stick creates a staccato sound. And so, to me, the smoothness, this this flowing sort of sound, to me, brushes are like water or like air, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. kind of constantly moving and breathing and flowing. Um, and my very first pair of brushes uh, were bought for me by my mom one Christmas. And uh, mom was a, uh, had a great voice. She had studied piano as a child. And uh, she, we had a piano in the basement. And she wanted, she would play periodically at Christmas, mm -hmm. White Christmas, the mm -hmm. famous Bean Crosby. And uh, as I took drum lessons, she thought it'd be fun for me to accompany her. And she knew that I was <laughs> drawn to brushes and jazz. Right. And so she bought me my very first pair of brushes so that I could accompany her while she sang White Christmas. And it's one of the warmest memories I have of my early days, you know, uh, learning music and the support I had for my folks. Mm -hmm. So if, if you were to give her, um, I, I'm going to assume that it would be trial and error, understanding first, you know, when you get your drum, when you buy the accessories to go with the drum, is really to know what genre and music you want to play or get into to even venture, or is it just trial and error to say, okay, you know, I've gone through a few different things. It's not, I, I don't, I, I, I don't understand how that works because I would think you would have to know your genre. Yeah, it, it's all, it's a, it's a journey. It's a, it, there is some trial and error and, and it depends on the, the mentors and teachers you have and how they guide you. Uh, and you almost inevitably will make some mistakes. I bought some equipment early on that was just, you know, uh, it was like, that's not the right symbol. I, it, you know, drummers are funny. Mm -hmm. The, the never ending quest for the perfect set of symbols. <laughs> that is the drummer's journey. And, uh, I, you know, I am 57. I started playing 49 years ago, uh, was my first drum lesson. And, uh, I don't think I arrived at a set of symbols I loved until about 10 years ago. So, you know, it's like, we're always looking for that to achieve that sound we have in our mind. So yeah, trial and error, uh, you mature, your ears change, your desires change. While I've always loved jazz, I've also played a little R and B, some top 40, a little bit of country, you know, smooth jazz, traditional mainstream jazz. I, I've been a gun for hire. So I play what comes along, but, um, uh, but you know, Speaking of, I use the word journey, and it reminds me, before the show, we were talking about your focus on uh, people's journeys and right. how they become who they want to be in the context of the businesses and lifestyles they create and that sort of thing. And that's what the album, The Drummer Loves Ballads, is really all about. I mean, it, it started 40-some-odd years ago. 
in a moment that was a moment of rejection. Mm -hmm. But 40 years later, it became this album of reflection. Reflection on relationships and good memories and gratitude and what's really important in life. That's really how the 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 essence of the uh, of the album emerged, um, and I wanted it to be this really unique full album listening experience. I wanted to tell a story start to beginning. I wanted it to have to reward the listener for listening closely as well as casually. Um, and I wanted it to be fresh, but familiar. I wanted you to, to say, yeah, there's something new here, but it could also feel like a long lost love jazz album. Um, and, you know, honestly, thanks to a huge number of people, 34 people were involved in the production of the album. That's the album we made. And for me, when I think about that journey from that kid in Kansas City, Missouri, experimenting with the different equipment, trying mm -hmm. to find what he loves, uh, figuring out how it all works that journey to today when now this album has had worldwide airplay and you can buy it everywhere you buy download stream your music whatever is extraordinary it's unbelievable to me and it's i've just ridden this this ride of rhythm uh, on my journey over the years so let, now that kind of uh, moves us into the music part because before i ask this question I first want to, I want people to hear just one of the, I, you know, I was, um, this, this particular session that you guys are in, and, and just one of them, but I'm going to ask the question after that, okay. um, because I think it goes directly within what we're, got, we're about to listen to. So everybody who's listening that you are on one of your favorite podcasts, um, make sure you listen in and share it, because um, this is just, it, it speaks to me, so this is, that's what I'm going to ask about it. So let's share it really quick. And so people can hear a bit of it and see if you're streaming somewhere on LinkedIn or wherever you're streaming on. It's romantic. It it's um, jazz full. It's it speaks to you. And I would think that being an artist, being a musician, without lyrics, because many of us listen with lyrics, so that's where you get your you know your inspiration or your or your feeling. But to be able to write, play music with no lyrics, but the music speaks to you. Do, do you understand well, what I'm you know, saying? Yeah. No. You know. It's, um... It's interesting. It's a, there's a grand tradition in jazz of both instrumental and vocal music. And mm -hmm. that's a, a song called Memories of You. It was made famous by Benny Goodman. Um, I, I mean, and goes back, goes back decades. And, um, uh, you know, so much of music has this, this sort of twin characteristics, in my opinion. There's something about it when we first hear a piece that we just respond to. But then, as we hear it repeatedly, it might become a part of our personal tradition, mm -hmm. or it might be connected to certain memories and experiences. And the reason I chose Memories of You to be on the album is because uh, I have always associated that song with a, a, a musician I used to play with in Kansas City by the name of Steve Patton, who passed away several years ago from pancreatic cancer. Steve and I 
four on gigs together for probably 20 years. And I just loved the way he played that, that tune. And so, you know, most of the time you get requests from the audience. Mm -hmm. I would always request from the bandstand to Steve, like, say like, Hey Steve, I want, you gotta do memories of you tonight. And so I wanted to do that tune as a tribute to him, as a part of remembering him. And because of the way that made me feel, not just in the moment when I heard that song, but for years as a part of a friendship and a musical relationship. So, you know, again, how, um, how those little impulses that ride across the air, because that's all music is, is air and movement, mm -hmm. hits our uh, eardrum, which translates it into electrical signal that our brain processes, how that... The, you know, how our bodies and our brains decide, ooh, I love that signal, and I don't love that signal. I don't know. <laughs> but I love these signals, and uh, it's now associated with this really warm memory for me. And so that that's how it ended up on on the, the, the record. And the person that you saw playing it is a man by the name of Lynn Zimmer, who's an extraordinary clarinetist, who's had uh, a stellar career um, traveling and re traveling the world and recording with people like Al Hurt and uh, um, just some really extraordinary musicians. So when it comes to playing or, um, you know, um, I guess like, um, like, like you were saying, you know, pieces that by some influential artists of our time, and then you're going to play that piece, I would think it'd be a, a somewhat of a pressure, you know what I'm saying? And then how you select the orchestra behind you and the players, how do you, you know, how do you know what best fits? I mean, because some people always change things up. It's not exactly what somebody did before. Right. You want it to be better, but not competitive, but you want to pay due diligence to, to the, to the, to the creator, basically. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're exactly right. And you're getting to a really important part of the, the, the creative process on this album in general. Um, so I have just a, a wonderful lifelong friend, my buddy, John Cushon, who I've known for, um, 35, 40 years or so. And John is a world-class A-list drummer. He, uh, uh, you may know the name Olita Adams. John yeah. is Olita Adams. Yeah. Uh, drummer, uh, music director, road manager, and husband. Uh, and so I've known John and Olita most of my adult life. As a matter of fact, I turned, uh, the, the, the day I turned 21, I was listening uh, to Alita in, in a local club in Kansas City. So that, that's how I spent my 21st birthday. So um, so I asked John if he would be the producer of the album. And we, he sort of debated. He doesn't like the term producer because he felt like I already had a pretty good vision for the album, but I didn't know how to make it, and he does. So one of the things that we talked a lot about is uh, the, the, the tune selection and the way we were going to represent those tunes and, and his his great piece of advice was if you're going to record it like it's already been recorded by somebody else what's the point and so look for your own stamp on it and i and i've always enjoyed you know thinking about different ways to approach things so there's a mix on here things like memories of you they're pretty much a straight homage mm -hmm. that's how it's pretty traditionally presented but there are other tunes that we distinctly chose different approaches for, mm -hmm. uh, for a variety of reasons. For instance, there's a song uh, called Point Sienna, which is sort of the drum feature on here. I've got a, a, a layered uh, overdub solo that I do on that tune. Well, it's another really old, decades old tune, made famous by the wonderful pianist Ahmad Jamal. And uh, his drummer that he recorded with, uh, Bernal Fournier, had a very distinct New Orleans style drum beat that is incredibly associated with Point Santa. When anyone does that tune, that's how they do it. And honestly, we tried a variation of that in the studio and it just didn't go well. We were gonna mm -hmm. just dump it. I'm like, I'm not happy with that. I don't think we're pulling it off. It doesn't, doesn't feel good to me. And uh, on a subsequent session, I said, you know, hey, why don't we try that as a shuffle, a little bit of a different feel, not this sort of Latin New Orleans kind of thing, mm -hmm. but a, a little bit of a more of a swing feel. We tried it and it felt good to us, and that's what's on the album. And that was just an attempt to try something new that felt good in its own way. And then sometimes you just hear things from the start. There's a the tune that closes the album is a tune called For All We Know, another classic I know that, uh, yeah. <laughs> part of the, 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 the standard library of jazz. 
and uh, Rod Fleeman is the guitarist on that, and Rod and I have worked together for years. I just adore his playing. And I just have always thought that tune would make an interesting bolero. Uh, now, it's usually done at the straight ballad, sort of like what you just heard, shoosh, shoosh, just gentle, swishing kind of sounds. A bolero is... It's got this little Latin, you know, sort of sway to it. And uh, I said, I want to try it as a bolero. And uh, I also want to try it as a bolero where I'm really almost <laughs> exclusively on, on the cymbals instead of the drums, just because I like that sound. It's purely self-indulgent. Mm -hmm. And we did it, and we all loved it, and that's how the album ends. So, so we tried to make some decisions to make things different, to put our own stamp on them. And, you know, musicians, like entrepreneurs, uh, in general, I think are preoccupied with possibilities. Yeah. What could we do with this? What is yeah. possible? Why does it have to be like it's been done before? And so you get a mix on the album of some traditional approaches and some fresher approaches. So why ballads, though? Is it just, you know, that yeah. that is your John? Not to say it's, it's not beautiful, but, you know, um, you know, but uh, very sentimental and um, being able to connect with, you know, connect with your listener. Um, why, why that choice of all the, <laughs> you, you know, um, I, it, there's so much, my dad used to say that, you know, people would talk about nature versus nurture, you know, how mm -hmm. our personalities evolve and, you know, what you're sort of born with and what you're, how you're cultivated. And he's like, there's always an X factor. There's yeah. just some unknown in every individual that you can't explain that is just a part of who they are. And I can't explain it. I don't know why. I just know that early on, uh, I responded very uh, candidly emotionally to ballads. And I think that it's consistent with just my personality and my emotional baseline. Uh, Frank Sinatra once described himself as being essentially melancholy. And I feel that same sort of yeah. uh, emotional baseline. I, I enjoy a, a gray and rainy day and um, I cry easily at movies and stories and, you know, uh, whatever. And um, I like to feel things. And I, and I love listening to Tower of Power, or Earth, Wind, and Fire, and feeling energy and pump. Mm -hmm. I love that, too. But there's just something about me as a person that is nostalgic, that is sentimental, that is emotional. Um, and that just you know ballads just speak to that part of me and so when I started playing you know I was probably the only kid my age wanting <laughs> to play brushes you know I want to open yeah. the and rock them to ACDC and that's great uh so I wish I had a better explanation for you other than ballads make me feel and they make me feel the way I enjoy feeling and I enjoy playing them to feel that myself and to pass that feeling along to others so I, I do want to bring up the fact that you um, actually, um, your background education is communication. That's right. So because of that, would you say that background in any way helped you in within um, your music and what you wanted to do? Because like I'm going back and saying being able to communicate by ear you know, without lyrics and, and people being able to understand what you're saying without words. Did, um, do you think that communication, that, that background kind of played a part in what you're doing? I think unequivocally. Um, there's a, one of the great um, designers of the 20th century was Charles Eames. And, and when people, if people are in the mid-century modern aesthetics, they know the famous Charles Eames lounge chair and mm -hmm. a variety of things that he and his wife, Ray, designed. And one of his famous quotes is, everything connects, that all influences are resources. Everything you experience, everything you try, can be tapped for the creative process. Mm -hmm. And the drummer loves ballads, connects all my dots. You know, everything I've ever loved and feel passionately about and hopefully am good at, merged and converged with the drummer loves ballads so the the communications part of it is certainly represented uh there we gradually developed this idea of these narrative interludes mm -hmm. so i tell an opening story mm -hmm. a prelude 
I have a little narr uh, narrative interlude uh, um, in the sort of in the middle of the album, mm -hmm. uh, and at, at the end, a coda. And it's a chance for me to tell stories through words uh, and to try and, and talk to the audience about what they're hearing. And so the prelude is all about describing that moment 40 years ago, that moment of rejection, when I was right. playing one of my first jam sessions as a 17-year-old kid. And the leader says, uh, after some burning tune like Cherokee, where everyone wants to kind of play higher and louder and faster than each other, turns around and says, what do you guys want to play next? And I said, as a 17-year-old kid, how about a ballad? <laughs> <laughs> Which yeah. it wouldn't be normal, I would think, Not, at all. Nothing normal about that. Yeah. Nothing normal about that. And he looks at me like I'm insane and says, a ballad? What's the matter, man? Are you tired? <laughs> and I said, you know, because that could be the only possible reason right. why ballads you need to lay back. And I'm like, no, I just love ballads. And he, he, he didn't say anything else. And as the story goes, he just turned around and kicked off another tune. I don't remember what it was, but I do remember this. It wasn't a ballad. And that's how the album starts, by me telling that story. And I, that's purposeful because as I was working on the project, people kept asking about the title, The Drama Love Ballads, where that really came from. And I could see this guy thinking, I'm trying to run a jam session right. and The Drama Love Ballads? So I kept telling people that story. And to his credit, John Kishan, again, his girl's producer said, you know, maybe you just, maybe you tell people that. Let's, let's tell them that on the album. And then once we did that, I decided to, to set up the, the one original on the album at the Trocadero, uh, which is a story about my parents. It's a, it's a duet between Lisa Henry, and, uh, a vocalist, and Doug Powell, a tenor saxophone player. Uh, it tells the story of this long forgotten jazz club in Kansas City that my parents went to when they were dating. I tell a little story about that, and then I close with a story. Well, that all comes from my experience as a writer, a public speaker, a communications professional, um, and it was natural and comfortable for me to introduce that part of myself and this, uh, these other parts of my professional lives into the album. Um, so yeah, everything everything connects my passion for graphic design. I had a professional designer that I worked with do some refinements and some final layouts, but I did the original design of, of the, the, uh, the cover, and uh, I wanted it to be beautiful as a full package, the writing, the storytelling, the music itself, every part of me that I could put in the album, I did. So when you, only because you talked about writing, you mentioned writing, and yeah. although, you know, some of the music I've heard and are without vocals, do you, do you find that you have to write, do you write the words to know how you're going to write the, well, the so, so the one original on the album is at the Trocadero, as I mentioned. Everything else on there is, um, uh, you know, cover songs. They're, they're, we're doing tunes that were written by others right. frequently many years ago. Sorry, you're probably hearing some sirens go down the street there. Um, but the one original is at the Trocadero. And it, honestly, Olita Adams is responsible for that tune, whether she fully realizes it or not. Uh, we were having sort of a series, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to the specific question here in a second, but I want people to understand where the song comes from. We would meet in Kansas City periodically at John and Leah's house to work on the project while we were recording in Kansas City or, or plan the next phase or what have you. And we were, John and I had spent a lot of the day together, and that evening we were just chatting, and Leah said, well, now, you're going to do an original, aren't you? And I said, well, Leah, I don't really write music. Mm -hmm. And she said, you can do it. <laughs> you can do it. And, and boy, what a beautiful lesson. And, you know, I've always been fortunate. I've always had people in my life who believed in me more than I believed in myself at any given mm -hmm. moment. And she got me thinking. Uh, and on the flight home, I started thinking, like, well, what could I write? And as a, as a writer, I can write words. And right. I've written lyrics before. Right. I'm not a composer. But Wayne Hawkins, who's the pianist in the quartet, I've mentioned Rod on guitar, Wayne on piano, Gerald Spates is the bass player, and he's wonderful as well. They're all from Kansas City originally. I knew Wayne uh, is a good composer, and so I, I had him in mind write the music, of course, and so I uh, I started scribbling out some ideas, and I started just thinking about this connection I had to ballads, and how much my folks loved that same style of music. Mm -hmm. And growing up since I was a little kid, until literally the day they died, whenever they would hear 
a really sultry piece of music, something sort of for a slow dance or to have that great sort of voo voo tenor saxophone in it, they would always say the same thing. That's just like the music we used to hear at the Troc. <laughs> the Troc was the Trocadero, which was this Trocadero. club in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. They met in 1955, they dated for one year and got married. And that summer of 55, they went to the Trocadero, the Troc in Kansas City, frequently. That was their live jazz club of choice. And they, they had, there was always a little trio there that played this little soft, you know, uh, slow dance kind of music, romantic stuff. And that, for them, was music they loved, but also music that held these warm memories for them. And I thought, I should write something about that. And so I wrote At the Trocadero. Uh, and it's their story of falling in love at, you know, with this club while they were falling in love. And uh, how it played such a role in their memories. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, even after they could no longer stand up and dance together right, in the room right. like they had 63 years earlier. Right. Uh, so... So for me, it was about writing the words to tell that story, literally. Handing those off to Wayne, who set it to a beautiful piece of music, and then putting them in the hands of these incredible artists. Lisa Henry is an extraordinary vocalist who's a real stylist mm -hmm. and can just exude emotion in the way that she sings. And, uh, uh, and Doug Talley's extraordinary tenor sax player that I worked with years ago in Kansas City. And I just had them both in my head for the song, kind of wrote it for them uh, to play, and they did an incredible job with it. It's a long story, but that's how I wrote and where it came from. Um, so from, so I read, I, I, re I read something somewhere, so I want to read it to you and then give me your thoughts on it, what I found okay. that I want to share with you. So it says, you know, a ballad is a form of verse, often as a narrative set to music, the form was often used by poets, composers, from the 18th century onward to produce lyrical ballads. In the later 19th century, the term took on the meaning of a slow form of popular love song that is often used for any any type of sentimental, but which can be used in pop, rock, or music. But although the term is associated with the concept of stylized storytelling, song or poem particularly used in the title, you know, such as like media or film, do you think that rule still applies? A ballad is a script. Uh, I think a ballads. I think ballads are stories, um, <laughs> and uh, it's. Uh, I'm so impressed with your preparation. That's, <laughs> that's, that's really. That's really incredible. You know, I, I like my guests. Really... If I'm going to say I want them on the show, I'm like I want you know I want to entertain my listeners. <laughs> no, it, it's great. You know, uh, again, as I was working on the album, musicians tend to automatically have an understanding of what a ballad is or what it means in this context. But mm -hmm. other people in my life who are non-musicians would occasionally say, well, what exactly is a ballad? Uh, mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. not as easy to describe as I sort of thought it might be at first. And I eventually defaulted to the, the uh, description or the answer that, you know, if it's something that makes you want to grab somebody and slow dance, it's probably a ballad. Mm. So, you know, music, that's true. But but I did start to reflect on its origins and exactly what you said. It was almost more of a um, prose or po poetry form mm -hmm. in its origins. It was about, it was a form of storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as a matter of fact, there's a, uh, there's a famous line in the, um, uh, the Michael, Mike Douglas, uh, no, uh, Kurt Douglas movie, Spartacus, the classic film where uh, Tony Curtis uh, plays Antonidas and he uh, is asked what he does. And he says, I'm a singer of songs, but then he recites poetry. You know, and, and the, that was sort of the, the origin of this meaning. The ballad was a story, a poetic form. But what appeals to me about that, about what I tried to do with the drummer loves ballads, is that even without lyrics, um, I tried to sequence the music and present it in such a way that it furthered this total story, that it helped tell a story. Mm -hmm. And it might be a story to sort of feel, but it had literal moments too with At the Trocadero. And there's a wonderful song, uh, The Shadows of Paris, that a young vocalist named Lucy Winans, who's extraordinary, sings 
uh, we did uh, with the tune Moonlight toward the end of the album, which is a duet between the late Molly Hammer and Ron Gutierrez. And that's a vocal piece as well. So there are vocal pieces extend, but I do think ballads tell stories. And you know, if you think about, uh, you know, really, uh, you know, faster musical forms, or uh, you know, like maybe a, think about a James uh, Brown kind of tune. Mm -hmm. Those are usually sort of riffs and maybe exciting lines and right. uh, sort of fun catchphrases, but they may not tell a story. You know, get on up. There's no real story, there, you know? <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, right. And, yeah. <laughs> and and so a lot of those forms, those hotter form, uh, forms of swing, whatever, may or may not tell a story. But ballads, you can't just recite a catchphrase. Mm -hmm. You're gonna linger over the slow moving flow and ebb of music. That's the moment where you're conveying a beginning, middle, and end, and a mood and a story. So. Yeah, I think the essence of ballads has always been story. Uh, and even as a musical form, with or without words, it, it, that's, that's what it's trying to do, is to convey this, this emotional moment. If there were any um, particular um, artist, male, female, whether it be um, composers, whether it be singers, or um, musicians playing an instrument, um, living or past, would you want to play alongside or play for? You know, have you considered who that would be? Yeah, boy. Um, I, Dave Brubeck, the pianist, uh, was, is somebody that I, I wish I'd had to, I saw him live with his quartet, his, his quartet in the 70s, which was his sons, actually. Um, but, you know, for those who may not know the name right off the bat, everybody is familiar with his music, whether they realize or not. Uh, the one of the most famous compositions on the radio in 1959 was a, a song called Take Five. Uh, and people still hear it on elevators today, uh, so to speak. That was a Dave Brubeck tune. He was the second jazz musician to ever appear on the cover of Time Magazine. The first was Louis Armstrong. Um, and he just... Uh, wrote and played beautiful music. When I was in junior high, uh, I found an album in my parents' collection in our Magnavox console, mm -hmm. you know, stereo, called Jazz Goes to College. And it was a live recording of the Dave Brubeck Quartet in 1954 uh, at, from a college tour, mm -hmm. which they sort of invented. Brubeck was the first to really reach out to colleges. The young people of the day were hungry for this kind of jazz. And I would come home almost every day from school during my junior high days, put on jazz, goes to college, lay on the couch, listen to that, and drift off. And I have such, it's probably the one record I've listened to the absolute most in my life. I can sing every note of every solo. Uh, it's just, it's a part of my DNA. And I, I have such an affinity for that album and that artist that, yeah, it would have been an extreme had I had the opportunity to to play with, with Dave, and I've known people who have, uh, but, uh, you know, that would be a fantasy for me. And uh, an artist, and this may be a little bit unexpected, but an artist that I wish I had gotten to see live and would have been aghast, to use his kind of word, to play with, would have been Sammy Davis Jr. Uh -huh. I just think, I think Sammy was one of the hardest swinging vocalists, all-around musicians ever, and I just, you know, it had that sort of Vegas showroom style to it, but man, yeah. he was a yeah. hard yeah. swinger, yeah. and it would have been a mate. Yeah. But then, you know, from there, you know, Tony Bennett, what an artist! What would it to, to 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 play brushes on? I left my heart in San Francisco behind Tony Bennett. You know, just mm -hmm. kill me now. Um, uh, and big bands, I'm a Count Basie fan. Uh, that if I could ever, you know, drive a big band, man, the Basie band would have been the one. What are your thoughts on like today's music when it comes to, I find that I know that when it comes to movies and film that and from what I've gathered is that um, orchestras are used often and um, often in like movie and film and stuff in it, yeah. which is preferred. And so, but then in today's music, so many people are using electronics versus what, I mean, you know, I'm in my fifties and even if you don't see the band, the band had so much emphasis on the music for now everything is just like okay let's do ele 
electronic and you kind of lose that it's more now um i don't know what to beat it's it's no connection you, you think that maybe the you know it's being underrated now that people should be you know using real live bands or the sound versus this technical like kind of keyboard yeah you know you're asking a guy like i said i'm 57 who who is in the uh you kids get off my lawn stage right, of life right, right. <laughs> so, uh but we're all a product of our time and i grew up and fell in love with music in the context of the artist plus the instrument equals right. the music and, it was, and it's a right. skill and it's a interaction between the artifact of the instrument and the artistry of the of the player and, and so I just have an affinity for that. I have a bias and I love that. I will say that I've gradually gotten more open to other sources of sound sources because that's really all it's about. We're all we're all just trying to manipulate sounds that uh, would be pleasing to us in one way or another. And um, if that comes from uh, a computer, you know, so be it. Uh, can't really say it's right or wrong. It, there's a real subject element to, to this. I do think that people who want to make music as young people today should still study music. I wish right. I had studied more. You know, I had, as you pointed out, my degree was in communications. I had a ton of hours in my college program in music, mostly ensembles. And I wish uh, I had done, I did some, but I wish I'd done more music theory and these sorts of things. Because uh, my belief is that technique enables passion. So yeah. if you have want to create or do, you're only going to be able to achieve it at a higher level the more technique or yeah. technical understanding you have behind it. And I have some limits on what I can do because my if my technique is here, then my passion can only get expressed here. If I want to express my passion at this degree, I'm going to need to get better at some things. So I think everybody who wants to make music should study music um, at a at a at a traditional level, uh, and not just randomly play with sounds. But you know, oh, like I, I said, I it's agree. Off my mind. <laughs> just hearing what you said is why I asked because I I found that there's so there's quite a few um, performers. I say like you know the singers, but people who sing lyrically, but they're like you know they have several. I find the more the more successful artists have a background in playing yeah. different instruments. Then I, I just see that um, their their music is different because maybe they because they know the instrument, they can write the lyric, they understand what they're lyric going to what they're playing. Versus people who just don't have any and they're just singing. Um, then you just find look for a beat. Yeah, I mean that's that's that's. Yeah, I tend toward that same belief, and there's yeah, I, I'm yeah. not a big pop music listener. I, mm -hmm. I sort of bore easily with that, and um, I'm looking for a different sort of connection to my music than what that gives me. Uh, but but I find things that I still like here and there. But you know, the, a big sort of debate that has gone on as long as I've been alive and before me, I know, is you know, is jazz in good hands? Is jazz dead? Is, will jazz survive? And, I think jazz is in great hands. I don't worry about jazz. I know people in their 20s who have skills way beyond what I was doing in my 20s. Mm -hmm. uh, there's this wonderful thing where each generation gets the benefit of all of the previous generation's yeah. learnings yeah. and experiences, but they get it in a compact, highly condensed form where they get access to it so much quicker. It may take this generation a lifetime to accumulate this knowledge and then in the course of a few years of study, the next generation gets it all, you know, or has access to it. So I think right, the skill level of musicians in general just keeps rising. And I love plenty of young musicians uh, on the jazz scene today. I agree. I, I don't think jazz is going anywhere. Just like you, some people used to think that the country wasn't going to, like, oh, it's going to go, it's not, you know, it's kind of tuning out, it's mellowing out. But... If you really pay attention to even new artists today, I hear so much from, you know, music from the the sixties, the fifties, the sixties, and the seventies, and um, where they're utilizing, you know, sound because I mean you can only be so creative when you don't um, 
when you like you're you're not you haven't taken any kind of music music classes, but we I hear so many things, and then of course when Lady Gaga and Agaboublié, and you see, and people are like, oh, like they're thinking like this sound is new. It's like not really. It's not really new at all. Um, and um, but there's so many artists using the past sound. So I agree. I don't think it's going anywhere. You just if you hear yeah. you're, it's there. It's still in the music it's, today. Right. And I I think those two know very well what they're doing. I think they know yeah. where they're coming from. I think they've done their homework. But you're right. Uh, it. it it's a, it can be a constant source. You know, I have a, um, one of the things I do in my, my day job on the communication side is uh, I'm a creative strategist and I help clients build uh, communications programs uh, and develop the ideas that they're going to communicate. And one of my beliefs is counterintuitive. I like to use the phrase, think inside the box, not outside right. the box. And, right. and the metaphor for me is if there's nothing inside the box, nothing can come out of it. You can only create from what you have. And so the actual creative process is not inventing something out of thin air. The actual creative process is fueling yourself, putting things in your, into your box, metaphorically, that you can draw from and combine into new patterns. So that's the value of broad listening, of studying your history of, 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 of your music education, because it simply gives you more to work with. Um, there's, there's a tune I mentioned earlier on the, on the album called The Shadows of Paris, which was actually written for the one of the Pink Panther movies. It's from the soundtrack from A Shot in the Dark. It's a Henry Mancini thing. And it's this beautiful sort of Parisian waltz. Uh, it's a lament of, of an illicit love affair. Um, and I've always liked the tune and wanted to do it, but uh, wanted to do it in a, in a different way. And it became kind of the single on the album. It's really, it's gotten the most airplay and it tends to get the most attention from folks but we created a prologue to it which is a, a portion of the Brahms third symphony third movement mm. so how does one end up taking this 1960s movie soundtrack right faux French waltz mm -hmm. and a German composers classical piece and put them together well that's stuff I had in my box that I could draw from and I was thinking about the shadows of Paris one day as I was doing things here at home and happened to have the Brahms on in the background. I've always loved that particular symphony. And I realized like, oh, I think harmonically that's compatible and we can make, we can make the tempos work together and it sort of has a similar melancholy mood and yeah. So I went to our arranger and I went to John and I said, I got this crazy idea. I think we can combine the Brahms and Henry Mancini. Um, and that is exactly what you're describing. That's drawing on the past. That is being aware of influences and resources. But you got to have that sort of intent to say, what can I work with? And these two mm -hmm. things go together. You get a whole new experience of this moment that hasn't been created before. Well, I really, um, I know we're coming to the end of the show, but this was such a wonderful interview because um, it a actually educated me. So as you see, I had some stuff I want to learn myself. Well, you were you were doing a lot of <laughs> self education and preparation. Again, yeah. I'm impressed and thank you for that. Um and actually as I sometimes tell people when I have guests, um and some of the guests it actually it helps uh it's so that I can get information. <laughs> it's not the truth. Aside from my listeners. So for everybody who has been um watching or listening on your favorite podcast where you download or maybe on the website where it's streaming I always want to say thank you always for tuning in and subscribing and down those downloads are amazing. Um, I want to make sure that everybody checks out the website to watch the full interview and John will let you know where you can find him, but you can also go to the website entrepreneurlifeshow.com to connect with John, but he's also going to tell you where you can find him and get his music. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share that with people. The Drummer Loves Ballads is available everywhere you buy, download, or stream your music, all the major platforms. I'd love it if you visited the website, which is thedrummerlovesballads.com. There's some great video liner notes that tell the story behind the tunes. Um, you can buy off of the website. Uh, the album looks like this. And um, there's also kind of a cool little companion booklet that's available separately called... Um, uh, that cool 50s craze. Was that on the website? I didn't see it. 
It's, it's in it's on the oh. website store. So there's a line okay. in the app Trocadero, um, cocktails and gin is that cool fifties craze. Okay. And inspired me to have uh, five custom cocktails commissioned, inspired by pieces of music off the album. So it's kind of a fun uh, add-on to mm -hmm. check out. But uh, you know, go to the uh, YouTube channel, go to the website, go to Apple Music, Spotify, wherever. Uh, I just you know, for me, this is all about wanting to put a little drop of beauty in the world as my contribution to the universe, and I hope people enjoy it and um, seek it out. Well, thank you again for being on the show. I'm extremely appreciative. And for everybody who wants to see who is going to be on next week's show, go to entrepreneurlifeshow.com, check out the calendar, and make sure you like all the guest interviews. Until next Thursday, everybody, see ya. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Until next time. Thank <laughs> you.